Okay. So let's, so let's get going then. Michelle, thank you so much. This is, we're really super excited to have you. I think that this is a time where there's a lot of uncertainty. A lot of emotions are kind of stirring up within all of us, whether it's because we're in confined spaces with nobody to talk to or in confined spaces with too many to talk to and you just want to be alone. Um, So it brings up a lot of stress. And then, you know, we're watching the news and such. So why don't you take it away? Sure. Oh, that's such a perfect lead in because I can imagine if you think about all the emotions as a spectrum, we are running the spectrum. Um, Just the other day, I was feeling awful. I was feeling lethargic. I was feeling like I don't have the motivation. And then I decided to take a sort of what I like to call mental health day or self care, self love day. And then I woke up the following day feeling pretty rejuvenated. So I think all of us have to do what we can to create these anchor points, these lifelines and anchors, as I call them. Um, Why don't we take a look at this concept I have around um, flagpoles and flags. We're going to move to the the first slide. And what's interesting here about this concept is that, you know, think about how you're feeling now, how there's so much coming at us. Um, and many of us, particularly many of us on this channel, you know, may have children and we're caring for aging parents. And that can be very stressful. Children may be home or may have returned home. And if our parents aren't living with us, many of us can't get to them because some of us are on stay at home orders. Some of us are um, concerned about transmitting something to our parents or others. And so it can create a lot of stress. And so you see there's Um, a plethora of things that can kind of make us feel a little ungrounded. So if you think of this analogy of the flagpole or the flag, which would you prefer to be? Whipping around in the storm of life, in the wind, do you want to be that flag that kind of is at the mercy of what's going on? Or do you want to be that nicely anchored, centered flagpole? And I don't know about you, but I've been the flag. Uh, I was the flag as recently as the other day. Oh, me <laughs> I too. I much more <laughs> prefer the flagpole. And so uh, uh, Reese and I were joking about some of these things on the list. And I'm, I, I can imagine that you all can identify with some of these things on the list. I would actually invite you to put something in the chat box. What are, what are the things that are making you feel like the flag right now? And how, you know, what's going, what does that feel like? Um, one of the things on here, the third one is maladaptive coping habits. And here's my bad habit. Uh, When I was growing up, we weren't allowed to eat any of those sugar cereals that you would see on TV that made it look like everybody's childhood was just a dream if you had those cereals. And as an adult, I see that my coping habit is I'm eating a lot of Captain Crunch these days. Probably not a good thing, but that's what I'm doing. Um, So we all kind of... um, do different things in response to what's happening. And Nicole, I see that family and health, absolutely. Um, our family, for many, um, it is one of those things that, that is, uh, reminds me of the um, commercial for, I think it was the Army year, decades ago, and it would say it's the toughest job you'll ever love, right? There's so much that uh, we get from our families and there's also so much that we have to give and striking that balance can be really difficult. And it always has an impact on our health and our well-being. So, yeah, family, friends, we can feel burnt out. We can feel, especially in these times that are uncertain, feel even some fear and anxiety. Poor rest and sleep. Yes, Angie, I completely can relate, and I'm sure others can as well. Uh, Many of us may not even be sleeping well. We may be going to bed, but we may not be getting really deep sleep. And so... Um, We need to pay attention to that and figure out how do we then cultivate the conditions that best support us to navigate this time. So I want to move to the next slide and talk a little bit about um, emotions, right? Like what's love got to do with it? What's anxiety got to do with it? What's fear got to do with it? We see the listing of emotions. And here's the thing that's really incredible that we have learned is that Emotions, well, let me ask this question. You can put it in the chat box. How many people think that emotions start in the mind? Oh, I'm sad. Or emotions start in the body. You can just put mind or body. Go ahead and put it in the chat and let's just see. (laughs) 
I'm definitely a mind person, but I've learned through you and uh, a couple of other people that yes, it's not as obvious as we as we may think. Yeah. Mind, mind. Yes, I'm seeing Nicole and Angie at Paul. Thank you both, mind and body. Yeah, there is a really, really interesting connection. And I'm not going to give away the, uh, the punchline until I share two things with you. <laughs> and so let's go to the next slide. And I want to share two interesting studies that help architect this little roadmap about how do we, how do emotions show up in the body? So let's move to the next slide. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what's called the physiology of emotions, just sort of the sensations, where do they show up? So uh, there was this study that was done in uh, Finland, of all places, and um, this is a, a little bit older study, but there's been more emerging uh, research around emotions, and the two together, um, I think, bring us to a very interesting point to help us understand the role that emotions play. So I'll, I'll uh, give you the first. The first is, in this particular study that was done in Finland, you see these silhouettes of or body maps, kind of like heat maps in front of you on the screen. And uh, what they did was they took a cross section of people from uh, Europe to Asia. And so they were cross-generational, cross-gender, cross-cultural, all these things. And they gave them up two blank silhouettes of the human body. And to the right of the second silhouette, they had a, either a video, a word, or a picture that suggested a particular emotion. And uh, they were asked to color in the silo one silhouette with orange red where they felt increased sensations, you know, feelings in the body could be tingling or whatever it was. And then the other silhouette they asked, and when you think of this emotion, if you feel a dulling or a decrease in sensation in your body, sort of indicate that that's where you see the blue. And then they took the two silhouettes and they superimposed them. And what you see here are these heat maps. Now, the interesting thing that was discovered in this early round of research was that um, people generally tended to hold the same types of emotions in the same general areas of the body. And we're going to practice with this in a, sec in a second uh, to show how this is true for, for each of us. Now, some of the newer research says the problem with that is that what I call anger Risa may call frustration. And so it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. So we have to be very careful about how we um, sort of generalize the emotion as experienced by each person because it, it is different. Context matters, person, you know, each person matters. But the general information and tip that we can take away from this is that we individually tend to carry emotions in specific places in our body. Now that's the first part really important. We want to remember that. Um, the second part, the reason it's important, incredible. Let me tell you about another study. Let's move to the next slide. Um, this one is called the Iowa Gambling Task, and it was done here in the U.S. And what they did was they gave people uh, four decks of cards, two red, two blue. And they said, okay, we want you to play this gambling game. And I want you to uh, tell me how to maximize your winnings. Now, what's interesting here is that after about 50 cards, people had a hunch that the red deck was a little fishy. They weren't sure what was going on. They had a hunch that something was a little off. What they didn't know was that the red deck was actually rigged, the red decks. You could only really maximize your winnings using the blue decks. So at about 50 cards in, they started to have a hunch something was up, something was fishy. And it wasn't until 80 cards in that they had full cognitive awareness, meaning they had in the mind, they knew something was wrong and here's what it was. Now, let's take a step back. That was 50 cards and 80 cards. Now, the interesting thing that they also did was they attached electrodes to the palms of the hands of the participants. The kinds of electrodes you see with people who take lie detectors. Um, now, how many cards in do you think, well, let me, let me step back for a second. 
the thing that we need to know is that the um, sweat glands in our body respond to temperature. Most of them do. That's why on a hot day we perspire. All of them except the ones in our hands, those respond to stress. That's why when you're, you get nervous or you're about to do something where you feel a little anxious, your palms may get a little wet. Like a live stream. Like a live stream, like a live stream when the technology doesn't work. <laughs> That's right. And um, so let me ask, and, and it, you can put the numbers, your guess in the chat box. How many cards in do you think it took before the body started to notice something was going on? How many cards? So remember at 50 cards, there was a hunch. At 80 cards, there was full cognitive awareness. Yep, this is what's up. So go ahead and put some stuff in the chat. What do you think? How long did it take the body to notice? Oh, the first feeling, you mean? Yes. Hmm. I'm going to... Thank you, Velma. 20. Any, what do you think, Risa? How many cards in? <laughs> uh, I guess it depends on how much alcohol has been. <laughs> um, I would say, I, I'm probably going to say 15, actually. 15. Okay, so we have got first card, Nicole. Ah, okay, so if I had some candy or a gold star, um, Nicole would be closest. Well, Nicole and Anna Maria. Damn, really? They actually, it was at 10 cards in that the palms on average started to perspire and coupled by the behavior of people starting to reach for the blue decks more. So they'd reach for the red decks, hands would perspire, and then they would sort of shift and, like, and go to blue. So the body knew at 10 cards in, on average, not everybody, but on average, about 10 cards in. Thank you, Paul. 10 cards. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, and, uh, then think about that. The body had the signal and information 40 cards before there was a hunch even brewing. That's crazy. And 70 cards before there was full cognitive awareness. So imagine that. Imagine the gap between things showing up in the body before we're aware of it. What do you think happens when things show up in the body first when we're not even aware? Imagine how that impacts our decision making and our behaviors. So all kinds of things can happen in between the time it shows up in the body and it shows up in the mind. And our jobs are to be aware sooner so we can minimize that gap. It's a gap in information. And this is where emotions show up easily. Now this isn't to say that you can't think of something and then have it be attached to an emotion it just means that generally motion or physiological sensations that often show up first in the body. The reverse can be true too, but oftentimes it shows up physiologically in the body first. Um, so, so I would say that um, it's a little bit of a dance. And uh, so, what so do you, you think about that? So you can actually train Risa? your mind. So does that mean you can actually train your mind to be more aware of your body? in order to, I guess, yeah, when they say listen to your body, I guess <laughs> they mean literally. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, yeah. you can. You can train your attention. It's one of the ways to train your attention to check in and do a practice. And so um, so I wanted to think about, let's say, Risa, give me, uh, can you think of an example? I know we had a great one at the top of our time here together when we started, but give me an example of, um, something that is that creates a little bit of anxiety for you. Oh, I have loads. What which <laughs> one do you? <laughs> um, what uh, uncertain uncertainty definitely uncertainty. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give the example of last night. Uh, I helped out at my family's restaurant. And because they have been so overwhelmed because the customers keep coming and they actually have too many orders. And I hadn't worked at the restaurant in 30 years. So there was a lot of anxiety just to make sure that I wasn't going to screw up the orders, that the, you know, that the customers were going to be happy, that, you know, we would still be able to function. I would still remember how to do the stuff. And, you know, there's a small window. So when there's like a time crunch, I get anxious because I... I want everything to be under control, right? Yeah. Which 
like this, like live streaming when, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's all a big experiment and I just try and I, you know, I just try to keep going up to bat and seeing, you know, um, but the anxiety is still there. Absolutely. So let me ask you, that's a perfect example. And I'm sure everyone, um, I want to share this with you and then we're going to actually practice it together. But so Risa, when you think about what you went through last night, just kind of bringing that to the surface, even if you just close your eyes to bring all your attention to your body, where do you feel anxiety in your body? What, where do you feel some kind of sensation? Oh, hundred percent. My lungs. Mm-hmm. Like I can't really breathe properly. Um, and then in my shoulders, I think, and definitely my palms. Uh, okay. And so like the energy is like very frenetic. Um, So I know, you know, and I do know at a certain point, I know that, you know, that's when the mistakes happen. So I do try to calm my mind and, you know, try to like, okay, just take a little time out type of thing. Um, You know, that's what age kind of an experience, life experience kind of, (laughs) hopefully, I mean, you know, 30 years ago, I was not like that, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So you have two locations for anxiety, your chest and the palms of your hands. And the palms of your hands, uh, is that a temperature shift? Is that a moisture? Uh, What happens with your hands? What does it feel like? So you've identified a location. What's the sensation feel like in your hands? It's definitely sweaty. Um, At the beginning, at the top of this whole live stream, my palms started getting sweaty, um, for sure. And oh, and it's also heartbeat. I think my heart starts to race also for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and so but, we're seeing some others too. Uh, Nicole gets chest tight as well and chest and stomach for uh, Grand Chic Domain. Um, let's say Chest and stomach. Yeah. Chest and stomach. I'm assuming you and mean so, like your t- stomach gets all knotted. Tight. Oh. Well, Nicole is, her chest feels tight. Um, and what about you? You mentioned your chest as well, your lungs. What do you feel? Constriction? Do you feel? What do you feel? Yeah, constriction. I mean, I'm also very sensitive because I was asthmatic as a kid. So the moment I can't breathe brings on more anxiety, which is kind of counterproductive. But but yeah, but I know not to the point of hyperventilation, but I do know people. It's. I mean, that's the beginning of a panic attack for many people, right? Um, when they can't breathe properly and they're not allowing, you know, the blood flow into their brain. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so I think that breathing is, a, is you know, my way of trying to counteract that, even though I know my chest is really tight. But when the, when the stress, when you're in the moment of it all coming down right now, it's really hard, right? Um, right. And it is amazing how your your body, I guess, is trying to tell you something. Um, but a lot of times I think we just shut that off, right? Because we're trying to deal with whatever we're trying to deal with. And for whatever reason, we think that that's going to solve the problem as opposed to kind of learning how to step back. You know, I, I feel like there's a lot of conflict between the mind and the body. And maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, there's certain training that we have cognitively that doesn't necessarily match with what's happening to our body and maybe that's what happens when people are sick right they ignore that they're sick they don't want to really listen to their body because they're so busy working they have to take care of the kids they have so many things to do right so they're like it'll be okay it'll be fine and then to the point where they've ignored it way too long when their body has been trying to tell them something yes you know that's a really good point too because I always say that emotions are like boomerangs (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. If you don't listen the first time, you know, it might whisper at you. It might give you a little flicker of information. You don't listen. It comes back a little bit. Now it's knocking at the door. You don't listen. The next time it's banging at the door. And then finally, it just knocks the damn door down. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so we have to, we, it's really important. I mean, we have, we've been taught from childhood that the brain, that the mind is where all the intelligence sits. When in fact, it is ignoring the rest of our bodies that is an incredible design that feeds into all the information. It, it, the information centers that are situated throughout our entire body. 
And so it's very important to listen to what the body has to say. So that, that you know, there's a saying that um, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is um, uh, a teacher and um, Tibetan monk, um, and he says that the, 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 the longest distance or the hardest kind of distance you'll ever have to travel is the 18 inches between your head and your heart. Mm. And that's because we are often trying to rely on the mind for everything, but we are social creatures. We're designed to be connected and to be and feel loved. And when we try to be rational about everything, because we also hear language about stop being so emotional, you know, or (laughs) stop acting like that. Uh, You know, that is incredible to me. I don't want to deal with anybody who has no connection to their emotions because to me, emotions are the cradle or the lens or the weaving of, that kind of infuses the actions we take and the decisions we make. And if they don't have a lens of an emotional lens, which is also important from a brain science standpoint, a thing that's really important to know too, is that um, the emotional brain, that center is one of the, the oldest centers of our brain. It's where we have the amygdala, for example. Has anybody heard of fight, flight, or freeze? That part of the brain that teaches us that there's something that we need to do, that we need to be aware of. But it has this sort of connection, this like um, neuro circuitry, this highway between that and what's called the prefrontal cortex, which is that area right behind your forehead. That part of the brain is a little bit younger, but that part does what's called sort of executive functioning. It does reasoning. And so the emotional parts will give information to, to the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex uses its executive reasoning to say, oh, okay, yeah, no, actually that's not a cyber a saber-toothed tiger in the brushes there. That's just a squirrel. We're okay. Or, you know what, that email really did make us mad, but let's take a breath, let's not respond right away. And so the two work together, and each of them play an important, pivotal role. So um, as we're moving through corona times and this pandemic, there are going to be lots of emotions that come to the surface. And here's the tricky thing. When we are in crisis or when we are feeling isolated or we're feeling alone, it isn't just the emotions of the moment that that come to the surface. Sometimes those conditions can bring up other emotions, other wounds, other traumas, and they join with the current state of affairs. And so um, to be able to skillfully navigate this, it's so critically important for us to um, be aware of what is fully present and to be able to sort of process them in a healthy way. Sometimes we can do that easily by ourselves, and sometimes we need to get some help. Um, there's a wonderful uh, friend of mine who worked in law enforcement for several years, and he believes that everybody should have this sort of, I call it a board of directors for your life, right? You have somebody oh, that's awesome. that helps you with things, right? So your board of directors, he says, should always include sort of a mental health kind of person, a physical nutritional person, and a um, and a spiritual person. So they're advisors in all those ways. And spiritual doesn't have to be religious. It can be whatever that is that feeds you. And then uh, the mental piece, he said, you know, there's so much, and we all know this, there's so much stigma attached to mental health, mental health challenges, mental health conditions. And that, you know, the day can't come fast enough for me when that stigma is gone because to ignore mental health also ignores that part of us that's just like the emotions. All of it makes up who we each brilliantly and magnificently are. So so paying attention to the body helps us first and foremost identify what's there. Now, we move to the next um, slide. I want us all to take a moment to try this out for ourselves. Um, and we're going to pick um, the emotion of love since we just did anxiety. Let's do oh, my daughter will on. love that. <laughs> yes, Ani, we're going to do love. <laughs> um, and the other thing is sometimes, you know, once it gets to the mind, we're also, our mind will also so, sort of want to label things, want to put it in a category. And this is very natural and normal for us too. <sighs> Next session, we talk about growth mindset and kind of healthy 
mindset so that we can use the proper lens and filter when we do receive emotions. How are we meeting them? And what's the story that we are telling when we experience them? So we do that next next um, next series part in part two. Uh, so just know that this is just the segment here. But why don't we move to the next um, slide? I don't know if you've done that already. I can't see it online. Um, I'm on feeling the feels. Okay, feeling the feels. So uh, sometimes, you know, in my work, I, I I grew up in the tech sector, but sometimes I work a lot with agents and uh, law enforcement, force responders, military, and you know, they're not known necessarily for showing their emotions or even acknowledging that they necessarily have them in the moment because they're very mission driven. We've got to get the task done and. Quite frankly, many times they are really working under such very difficult, high pressure, high stakes conditions. And uh, feeling the feels, I love it. I taught a session with someone who was um, uh, an agent in, in border protection, and uh, he was very kind of stoic. And at the end, he he told his uh, his his supervisor, "Yep, she she got me feeling my feelings in this one. Yep, okay, goodbye. I'm feeling my feelings. I got to go." <laughs> So, that's awesome. So there's nothing wrong, but but we can feel vulnerable, and that's the one thing I want to say. You feel into your feelings. Vulnerability is is necessarily part of that because we have such deep, rich lifelines and life experiences, or moments that are full of vulnerability. And know and just know that that's okay too. Like whatever you feel is what you feel. It's not good. It's not bad. But what we do have to remember is that we are not meant to feel isolated and alone, meaning like there's no help, unsupported. And there is a difference between feeling alone and feeling lonely, right? So we can be alone, like I'm happy being alone, reading a book, but I don't wanna feel lonely. And so when we recognize the distinction between the two and uh, see where how we can help ourselves, and some of that can come from within and some of it needs to come from without. So, Yes, Anna Maria, I agree. Vulnerability is important. And if anybody listens to Brene Brown's work around vulnerability, you also know that vulnerability requires courage. Because in vulnerable moments, it's the courage that helps us move through and navigate. Um, Absolutely. So, so let's move to love. Okay, so I'm going to invite everyone to just, you know, even if you're comfortable, just close your eyes and get comfortable in your seat. Or just gently start to soften your gaze and look downward. And I want you to bring to mind somebody you just adore, that you love so much that you would move heaven and earth for. That when you see them, either in your mind's eye or in person, you can't help but smile. You can't help but feel flooded with the emotion of love and adoration. You want the best for them. You're always at the ready to help them. And now think about bringing your attention to your body. Where in your body do you feel sensations when you're experiencing love. Sometimes people feel like a blossoming or blooming flower in the center of their chest is this opening. Some people feel tingling and temperature change and some people feel light. I want you to identify what you feel and where you feel it. Okay. So let's, if you're comfortable sharing, please um, put some things into the chat box. Where do you feel things in your body? We can start with Risa while people are putting it in there. <laughs> Oh, what God. do you feel and where do you feel it? Or where do you feel it and what does it feel like? <laughs> um, it feels, I, I get tingly. Like, I feel like, like all down my arms. And then I feel a lightness in my chest. It's kind of like almost the opposite of what I feel when I feel the stress. 
Um, I didn't, I, to be honest, I didn't realize I feel so much in my chest until today. <laughs> I guess uh, um, I'm good at ignoring my body. I don't know. Um, but yeah, and it just feels, and then in my head, I just feel like, you know, just, I don't want to say euphoria, but it's like that lightness of just happiness or just, um, yeah, it's kind of just this pleasant, very calming feeling, right? Feeling nurtured or feeling safe, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's really lovely. It's really lovely. And Raquel yeah. also feels it in her heart in her chest area, a warm sensation. And Angie says she feels warmth like it starts from the top down and then spreads throughout her body and limbs. And Velma mm -hmm. shares that she's got calmness, calmness and glow in her face and chest and arms, a lightness, and a smile emerges. Now, thank you, Velma, for raising that because all of you, um, we have some resources for everyone available after each session. And for this one, there is a, um, a bedtime body scan. And there is also this um, template of the body so that you can change out the emotions and do this practice on your own. So you can start to make your own body map. And when you think of things like um, who you care about or being happy, or even when you're in a challenging situation, you might want to play with bringing a slight smile to your face, just slightly curling up the edges of your mouth and see how that enhances or shifts the sensations that you feel. Yes. And Grand Chic Demain. That I actually works. It's amazing. Know. They do say that, right? Like just mm -hmm. put a smile on and the body will follow <laughs> or, you know, your yeah. emotions will follow a little bit. Um, Absolutely. I, I remember one time I was doing this practice and I had a lot of knee pain in my right knee and they told me, you know, just smile invited me to smile and I'm like that is so ridiculous okay whatever <laughs> and then I did it and I was like oh my gosh my knee feels better I couldn't believe it so I I always encourage people to, to engage in these kinds of invitations like you're shopping at the grocery store try it it's something new and then if you don't like it don't get it again or if you're if it's not ready for it now just leave it on the shelf um, but see what happens um, Ernie tingling in the arms and legs yeah, it's beautiful okay um, all right, so just remember, you can download this template, this feel in the field, get to know your body map. And I encourage all of you, the emotions at least start with the ones that you're aware of that you experience frequently and create a body map. Because what this does is that throughout the day, you have something to circle back to. So for example, I know that when I feel love, that example I give, like a flower blooming in the middle of the chest, that's how like I feel when I feel love. It just opens right up in my chest. But I also, when I'm feeling anxious, my chest starts to tighten and my shoulders um, tighten. So I already know throughout the day, I'm checking in with shoulders and chest, just periodically see how I'm doing there in case I'm missing the signal. So you can do that for yourself as you build your body map. And if you don't believe me, let me give you an example. Um, probably about seven years ago, I was at a, a program and this the, the teacher there was saying, you know, some people walk around with their shoulders way up here and they don't even know. And I thought, I, and we, then we took a break and I stood up and I said, how do you not know your shoulders are way up here? And then I realized my shoulders were way up here. <laughs> and just because we're not connected to our body, we're not aware of how we're holding our body. And the moment we bring awareness to the body, I will tell you, some of you may say, man, I wish I didn't know. You're gonna know. And once you know, you can't unknow, but it's a good thing because it's more information that helps you. Now, um, in the okay. last part, so these things come up and maybe they're challenging. What, what do I do when I experience some of these things, especially the stuff that doesn't feel so great? And maybe I don't have enough time to go and take a walk or go sit down and do a dedicated meditation. What in the world can you do? Well, there's a number of things. Maybe if we move to the next slide and we can talk just briefly about grounding and centering before we close our time out together. And what's interesting that I like to offer, there, there are two things, two ways to kind of support yourself. These things called dedicated practices and integrated practices. So 
a dedicated practice is kind of what it sounds like, you know, like I have a dedicated practice of meditation. I like to get up in the morning. I like to sit for 30 minutes and then I do my day. I'm not perfect. I don't always get it right. And sometimes I don't do it at all. And sometimes I have to do it later in the day, but I try to have a regular routine and I notice the difference if I don't do it. So that's dedicated. I dedicate specific time, place, whatever to do it. An integrated practice in comparison is one where in the moment we we just want to integrate it in the moment we're not trying to set aside time and the integrated practices I also like to call I like to use them because they're also things that you can do in what's called like stealth mode people don't necessarily have to know that you're doing it maybe you know meditating or something like that is very personal to you and you don't want other people to know because you're feeling a little self-conscious about it so you can do an integrated practice and an integrated practice in the moment when you're feeling stressed and you check in with your body and you notice your chest is tight or your shoulders are tight or your start, your head is perspiring. You can do what's called a free breath practice. Um, there are many, many things you can do in the moment. So this is just one to kind of whet the appetite. And I'm sure lots of people may have some and you can share them in the chat. Some people like to kind of envision grounding their feet into the earth or just feeling their feet on the floor, doing some other things. But in a three breath practice, here's how it works. Um, Risa, would you like to take the example you used earlier with the restaurant maybe? Sure. <laughs> Risa doesn't know what, what I'm gonna do. So no. she's kind of like, uh, <laughs> I think so, maybe. <laughs> I'm from so, New York. We have to be cynical, you know, <laughs> and suspicious. Right. Yes, yes. Discernment all the time. <laughs> okay, so three breath practice works like this. I'm going to practice. I'm going to show you with Risa, and then I want you to, we're going to give you a minute to, to do it yourself. All right, so if you recall earlier, Risa was talking about having to go to the restaurant that's family owned. She hadn't worked there in a couple of decades, but was called in to help uh, man the ship to help kind of keep things going. And she was very feeling a lot of anxiety. So um, here's how it works, Risa. The first breath, I'm gonna ask you to do this. The first breath, I want you to bring your attention to the sensation of your breath. Just, and you can close your eyes or cast your, your gaze downward, but the first breath, you're gonna bring your attention to your breath. The second breath, you're gonna check in with your body map. Just check in, where's my, where are my places after you learn your body map? And the third breath, this is where it gets interesting. You can make a declaration, you can set an intention, you can ask a question. And each, and I'd like to give um, options because in order to have any practice or habit work for us, it's gotta be something that works for us. So me saying, here's what you say on the third breath, may not work for you and you've got to create something else. But here's some, here's some things that could work. When you state an intention, think, okay, I am going, I'm going to get this done. I can do this. Or uh, all I have to do is one thing at a time. Or that could be something. Um, a but it has to be asked, yourself. It's not about like... It has like... to be whatever works for you. So it's not like yeah, I'm trying to create an intention about the situation. Is it just about your own emotions? Yeah. So it's a good question, Risa, because here's the thing I want to throw out to people is many of the time, much of the time we spend our time, energy, and effort on the things we can't control rather than the things we can control or influence. So if you look at the world of what we can control, what we control is actually the tip of Florida, the very, very tip, yeah. not even the whole long thing. It's like Miami. That's it, right, of the whole world. So, But we spend our time on all the other stuff that we can't control. So we have to think about how can I show up in this moment in that would serve the highest good here? And when you're serving the highest good, that means you're also serving yourself. This is not to sacrifice yourself. We all have to start with self so that our ripple effect across our ecosystem is elevated and positive and sustainable and creates a positive you know, impact. So your intention 
could be, I'm going to show up grounded so that I can help solve this challenge or what. So, but it should always sort of be like, what's your intention to how you want to show up in the next moment? Now that's when you want to sort of affect outside. But if you're just thinking like, all is okay, or a, a, an expression or a statement I've heard many people say is um, breathing in, I do my best, breathing out, I let go of the rest, or breathing out, I reset, or maybe ask the question, what's important now? Because when we ask ourselves what's important now, it's like the clutter starts to, like because we think until we ask that question that everything is important. But because things stack on each other, what's really important right now is to do this so that I can create the opportunity for the other things to happen in more harmony, in more smooth sort of execution. So you can ask a question, set an intention, or something like that, and with that third breath. That makes sense? Oh, I love, I love that what is important now question. I think that's valid and can be applied to so many aspects of so many different areas of life and then also at different times of your day even. Um, and it does. I think that can just reduce a lot of the anxiety um, and stress if you just frame it that way. That's awesome. Yeah. So if everybody sort of just takes three breaths. And on your own, first breath, bring your attention to your breath. Second breath, check in with your body. Third breath, maybe asking that question. What's important now? Okay. Three bre breaths to only take a couple of seconds. And so nobody has to know. You're and you're doing, doing it yet. anyway. <laughs> That's right. You got to breathe. <laughs> That's right. So it's just attaching attention and intention to those breaths. And the thing about taking breaths is that it brings more oxygen to the brain, which helps you think more clearly, it brings more oxygen to the body, which activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps to kind of decrease the stress, increase the calm. So those are the ways that I want us to it like initially ha engage in the conversation of it's okay not to feel okay, but you need to know what you're feeling before you can kind of move through it. And to remember to not judge how you feel. Because how you feel is how you feel. It's not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. But it's more a question of what serves you, what supports you. And if you are feeling in a way that doesn't serve or support you, then take steps to support yourself. And some people, depending on what it is, it's easy. You can take care of it by yourself. And others, there may be situations where we just we just need more help than we can provide ourselves. And to be okay with that too. Mm 